Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar, How to Gain a Competitive Advantage by Optimizing Your End-to-End -end Supply Chain. My name is Jerome Roberts, and I'm Vice President of Marketing for UPS Supply Chain Solutions, and I'll be handling your moderator duties today. I'm joined here at UPS by our three panelists who are all socially distanced through our presentation room. I'll be introducing them in just a moment. But first and foremost, on behalf of UPS, we hope you and yours are safe and well as we continue to work our way out of this global pandemic. These days, we're all facing very unique challenges from the difficulties uh, that we have with the pandemic, with our businesses, families, and friends. Uh, and here at UPS, our new CEO, Carol Tomei, has inspired us with a new purpose statement, moving our world forward by delivering what matters. This really fits into our topic today because our goal is to provide you with information and insights that will help you move your business forward and adapt to this new normal we're all experiencing. Walking us through these tips today uh, and insights will be the three great panelists that I have here in the room with me. First, we have Philippe Gilbert, who is the president of UPS Supply Chain Solutions. We also have with us today, uh, Steve Gunlatch, who is the president of UPS Global Logistics and Distribution. And we have Kathy Morrow Robertson, who is the founder of Logistics Trends and Insights. So Kathy, Let's start with you. How about you tell our audience a little bit about yourself? Sure. Thank you, Jerome. And thank you so much for inviting me to participate today. Uh, my name is Kathy Morrow Robertson, and I am a founder and president of Logistics Trends and Insights, a market research company focused on logistics. Uh, I have over 20 years of experience in the, in the supply chain industry with a variety of consultants and such. I also write for the Journal of Commerce as well as for Air Cargo World. Thank you, Kathy. How about yourself, Steve? Tell your, the audience a little bit about yourself. Thank you, Jerome. Uh, Steve Gunlock, president of UPS Global Logistics and Distribution. Uh, 28 years in the industry. Very excited to be here to share our experiences and give you insight to the audience that's out there today. So we certainly I uh, hope that you enjoy the uh, presentations and uh, discussions that we have today. Thank you so much, Steve. Philippe. Thank you, Jerome. Philippe Gilbert, I'm the president of UPS Supply Chain Solutions. I've been in uh, UPS for two years now and in the industry for 32 years in uh, multiple continents from Africa, Asia, Europe, US, of course, and Latin America. Excited to be here today to uh, answer questions and to be able to uh, give my view on the end-to-end -end supply chain. Excellent. Thank all three of you for being here and being able to provide these insights to our audience. But first, let's move on to a few quick housekeeping items before we jump into the discussion. As a reminder, uh, today's webinar is for informational purposes only. It's not legal advice. Please be sure to do your own research regarding these topics. Our agenda today will uh, be categorized in three major areas. First, we'll talk about front-end supply chain that deals with uh, logistics trends around air, ocean, and freight. Then we'll move to what we're going to call back-end, where we'll talk a little bit more about distribution, fulfillment, and last mile. And then finally, we will talk about optimizing the overall supply chain. How do we actually take a look at all these aspects and make sure that all of them are running smoothly? We'll wrap things up uh, with a Q&A segment uh, and then we'll be done for the day. So before we dive into the content, we wanna get you involved and understand uh, what is on your mind in terms of what we're going to discuss today. You should see a question on your screen I'm gonna take a little, little bit of time reading through this so you all have a chance uh, to reply to the question as we go. But what we're asking you here is what aspect of your supply chain concerns you the most based on what we're talking about? 
Is it the front end with Air and Ocean Freight and all the dynamics going on there, as we've seen earlier in the year that we'll talk about? Is it the back end that deals with the distribution, fulfillment, and some of the complications that we've got on the last mile? Or is it the overall optimization, risk mitigation, and managing efficiency throughout the overall uh, supply chain? And if all of those are an issue, obviously we have an option for you uh, to let us know whether you're concerned about all of the above. All right, let's get things rolling with our first category of topics around the first, the front end of the supply chain. So Kathy, uh, right around March, uh, when uh, things really started happening and we had some of the, some of the lockdowns, uh, Take us through kind of where we are, what we saw, where we are now, and then how should our audience think about some of the challenges that we've seen on the front end of the supply chain? Sure, thank you. Uh, so, give you a little bit of background. We'll start back in the March time period when the coronavirus ended up spreading around the world and it turned into a pandemic. Uh, as a result of that, we saw Air, airline, air passenger airlines, just completely grounded. Uh, capacity was becoming tighter than ever. Uh, businesses shut down, manufacturing shut down, and consumers more or less hunkered down in their homes, you know, to stay safe for about a couple of months or, or so. And as a result of all of this, we saw uh, world trade volumes uh, decline by about 14.3%, according to the World Trade Organization. And that was one of the biggest declines on record. Uh, and to give you some regional examples here, Europe exports declined almost 25%. North American exports declined almost 22%. And Asia ex exports declined about 6 7% there. But like I said, capacity was a big, uh, a big issue, and, uh, but the demand was still high, particularly for PPE uh, items and trying to find these products, source them, get them delivered to the right places. That was very challenging. But as we go into June, July, August, and even now, uh, capacity has been slowly improving. And... Um, However, what's interesting is as it's improving, analysts really don't expect the capacity to return fully to the market for at least a year to two years from now, which is a bit, um, like I said, concerning. But there has been some positive trade uh, data coming out. Uh, for example, the Port of Los Angeles. In July, uh, the July data showed that it was their second busiest July on record, even though imports uh, per uh, declined about 4.3% year over year. Uh, but for August, though, their import TEUs were up 18%. Likewise, Long Beach also saw um, a very busy July up about 20%. So that momentum is still continuing uh, now into September and first part of October. So how long is that gonna last? Well, that's anybody's um, game here, to be honest with you. No, no one really knows. It is such an uncertain market. But the World Trade Organization has um, recently issued a revised estimate for this year showing that the decline in, um, well, they expect total trade volumes to decline just 9.2% as opposed to their original 13 to 32% uh, decline estimate back in the spring. And then for the year 2021, they're expecting an increase of 7.2%. So it's going to be interesting, Jerome, to see how it progresses. See that the the um, demand is still very strong. Huh? Yes. The Capacity has been uh, uh, squeezed very hard, but demand is still here. Yeah, that's the amazing thing to me. I mean, PPE is still, there's still a high demand for that, but we also are seeing inventory replenishments that's been um, delayed from earlier in the year. 
and also because of the growth of e-commerce, preparing and also preparing for the holiday season. Mm -hmm. So it's just almost like a perfect storm. <laughs> and surely the disruption on every side has caused a lot of uh, delay, as you say. Exactly. And so it's, it's impacting kind of what they do now. Uh, but to that point, uh, Philippe, uh, let me let me kick this over to you in response to that. So given all the challenges that shippers had, uh, our uh, customers and our audience had early in the year due to the disrupted air, just getting their uh, merchandise uh, to the distribution center, how should they change kind of what they're doing? Because there's a lot of disruption Indeed. moving forward. Thank you, Jerome. Uh, indeed, a lot of disruption. And uh, yes, we are addressing the supply chain leaders, our customers, and they had to uh, be managing the supply chain disruption a lot. So uh, key terms for me for the supply chain leaders during COVID-19 has been resilience and is still resilience. When uh, I was reading not so long ago about uh, ADP research study, who was stating that the resilience not connected, is not connected to gender, race, uh, nationality, it's a state of mind created by exposure to difficulty. The more exposed, the more resilient you will be. The more changes absorbed, the more resilient you are. So it's interesting because I think we are creating more and more of this resilience, the more the pandemic lasts. I will address a few points, two points, one on improving visibility and deploying technology, and one about reconfiguring, reconfigurating the sourcing strategy and transportation mode on the improving visibility and deploying the technology to sell to your ultimate customers, we have seen that COVID-19 revealed a lack of visibility into supply chain. As an example, the lockdowns when they happen in China in Wuhan region created raw material scarcity or basic materials, for example, for high-tech companies, we, they could not find it. So communication with suppliers is a vital element on the sourcing side, as I mentioned before, but also on the supply chain risk. Your suppliers are able to help you to understand better what is close to them, but also contingency plans, also if there is congestion at ports, so to prepare yourself for that. Technology has a key role to play here to anticipate those risks. I would move uh, away from, uh, from the technology side and and focus on uh, more on the redundant inventory. Because as we are talking about uh, replenishment that you are mentioning, Cathy, I think there is going to be more redundant inventory that our customers have to manage. We see that on the surge of demand on warehouses, and definitely this will have a strain on both, I would say, the inventory costs that we have got and their cost on, on warehousing side. So this is going to be something that we need to be able to, uh, to focus on. And continuing on the, on the warehouses, the autonomous vehicles or drones that we were talking about, Cathy, earlier on, I think that's something that we are moving and we are seeing more and more uh, operators who are including that in their supply chain. So from moving and storing products. I will move on now to uh, reconfiguring uh, sourcing strategy and transportation modes. So I think that uh, the manufacturers are uh, today shifting uh, from China to Southeast Asia. So the winners are Vietnam, Indonesia, but also Thai Taiwan, Thailand. So we see that uh, this trend has been set with the U.S.-China trades, but it's also existing much longer before because of the cost of labor in China was incremented. There is also another element to, uh, to notice is the desire for shorter supply chain, the rise of near-shoring. So I'm talking about for Europe, Turkey or Morocco, and for, of course, USA, the USMCA, Mexico. Mex USMCA is developing a, a trade that is going to be much bigger on north-south. And I think that we are seeing already some effects of that. The, the, the usage of Mexico labor forces is going to increment. Then I will uh, continue on diversifying transport modes. Uh, during the, what you were mentioning about the PP and the crunch that we saw on the air side, our customers have been asking us to be able to find alternative. And I, I beg you to find alternative also continuously. Alternatives to be able to cross border on transportation. 
using ocean instead of air, using sea air options or LCR, less than container load, but also when you are uh, replenishing from China to Europe, rail can be an option. And I would say this will balance transit time and cost. So you need to have these uh, opportunities in mind. And remember one of the Chinese ideograms that uh, I received not so long ago via email or, or WhatsApp, it's the, the ideogram of crisis. Crisis in China has got two signs, the sign of danger and the sign of opportunity. So there is always, even when these crises happen, like we have COVID-19, there's always opportunity. Back to you, Jerome. Yeah, so with crisis, obviously it brings great opportunity as long as you react uh, properly. Um, one thing you said in there, obviously that I know that uh, our audience uh, could be a, a little set back on is obviously the redundant in inventory. How are they going to balance carrying redundant inventory with, with managing their capital? So yes. cl clearly a fine line to balance there. But uh, when we kind of wrap this section here on the front end of the supply chain, absolutely, uh, you have to take a look at the new dynamics uh, and, and be aware uh, of how you need to shift that based on what your comments there uh, were for Lee. So outstanding, thanks. I think that's uh, that, that kind of frames our first section of uh, front end. At this point, though, we want to talk about a little, little bit of the back end. Now, I know that um, our audience and there's, there's customers that have had complications getting inventory in. There's also been some uh, issues or some uh, inconsistent, very hard to forecast demand. Um, and uh, there's also been some very interesting things, Kathy, on in terms of trends, uh, in terms of brick and mortar. Can you take us through some of those those trends that are impacting the sure. uh, back end of the supply chain? Sure, sure. So we've already just talked about uh, the PPE demand. Uh, it's been high. It's still high. Uh, and now, as you know, Philippe and I both have have said, you know, the whole inventory uh, buildup also is playing a big uh, factor, a big role, uh, particularly within just the past few months. And we continue to see uh, capacity slowly improving, slowly coming on board between ocean, uh, air, as well as other modes of transportation. Uh, however, the rates uh, for all keep, you know, is pretty high. Uh, it's still high when you compare it to last year or some cases even just a month ago. And um, as Philippe had mentioned, the whole modal shift uh, is being used to optimize not only cost and speed, but also to find that capacity. So you may, you know, need to get creative in this uh, new environment. I apologize for using that. I wasn't going to use that phrase, but we are in a very different environment uh, versus last year. But yeah, air to, air to sea, uh, the rail, if you're moving goods from Asia to Europe and so on, it's, um, it's gonna take some creativity and partnering up with the right transportation and logistics providers. And so with that being said, overlaying everything, we have this sudden burst of demand for e-commerce that we just, we saw almost overnight uh, beginning in March. And as you can tell by the slide, uh, second quarter as a percentage of total sales, uh, total U.S. retail sales, e-commerce made up about 16.1%. That's in comparison with just 10.8% second quarter 2019. So we have this massive shift of people ordering online, expecting their goods, like yesterday or an hour from now, and that's kind of difficult to do. That's put a lot of stress on a number of networks, not only air and ocean, but also trucking and rail and the last mile. And it has slowed things down a bit, uh, particularly as you've seen, uh, we've seen that shift from B2B shipping to B2C shipping, that residential shipping. So if you remember the second quarter earnings call with UPS, uh, there was a comment of 70% of the ground shipments had shifted over to residential delivery. And, um, and that's a huge 
that's a huge shift because there's different elements involved in uh, delivering residential uh, last mile. And at the same time, we're beginning to see facilities, fulfillment facilities, moving closer to that customer to try to, um, to actually succeed in that same day or next day delivery. In some cases, that one hour delivery, because that is occurring in certain areas. And um, it's, it's tough. And so as a result, you're seeing these third party delivery lo locations, uh, UPS's alternative delivery points, for example, where you can a consumer or even a business, small business owner could pick up, drop off, return an item either at a UPS store, a Michaels, a CVS, or any other retail uh, partners. So there's the, the dynamics. It's just, it's changing almost on a daily basis, Jerome. It's yeah. amazing. Yeah, so clearly, I, mean, I think you're, what, you, what you're referencing there is the UPS Access Point Network uh, helping uh, you know uh, customers and businesses consumers and businesses in terms of uh, this. And I can tell you, it's, it's, it, it seems it's probably the entire year has been a peak season. I mean, uh, season, uh, I, don't, I don't even know if we can use that term for 2020 at this point, it's, it's been a constant. Uh, but let me, let me pivot it over in terms of this uh, conversation to you, Steve, on the contract logistics side. Uh, clearly, uh, all of this shift has to be putting a, a big strain on the capacity within the di on the distribution side. What 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 are your how are, how are you working with customers through this time, and what should they uh, keep in mind? Well, it's a it's a great question, Jerome, and, and thanks, Kathy, for the the intro on this. There are definitely challenges, and we've kind of broke it down really in three areas. And let's talk about the rise in direct to consumer. Um, we definitely see the customers experiencing the measurable shift from business to business to business uh, to customer. And in some cases, they're experiencing up to 30 percent uh, increase. In addition to this, we see customers supply chain moving from we'll call the planned efficient into the dynamic, as you talked about, Kathy, uh, to consumer driven compound this with our customer and their end user, that buying relationship is changing, becoming more transactional uh, with more selection, uh, certainly more options, uh, but with the same price. So what does this mean? Well, the demand window is now shortened and no more regular uh, you know, shipments, those days of uh, easy planning are really gone because customers are ordering for delivery tomorrow, today, uh, it's really, again, driven by the consumption and consumer. We continue to see trends in inventory shifts within the different uh, channels uh, to generate uh, the sales and, and, and meet uh, the demands of, of uh, consumers. So let's talk about an example. Um, uh, within our logistics and distribution, uh, we see our UPS e-fulfillment um, product um, moving in, um, in different channels is gener excuse me is increasing with our current partners and the importance of that connection brings the last mile the next day service and delivering their peak uh, is critical to their success in fact even reaching out for uh, support just for peak so if we move on to the demand for space and the complexities and serving multiple channels several weeks ago although i can't validate this but i think the theory is right that 1% um, increase in e-commerce requires 46 million in square feet. And that really makes sense when you think about the, the collapse of the four walls into the distribution network, and we see fulfillment and reverse logistics growing. In regards to examples, um, really we have over the last couple of months, we've experienced the uncertainty our customers have uh, towards the fourth quarter. Sales have increased demand and Again, the reverse logistics uh, overflow solutions to our customers. We have been, um, people have reached out to us um, where in the past have not requested this kind of reverse flow uh, solution and um, support. And now we see a very big demand. And I think that's a, a turning point as a result of um, purchase good returns. So let's talk about the, 
digitalization of this. This obviously reinforces uh, the importance of digitalization is necessary to drive better information sharing, obviously driving productivity improvement at the site level. We talk about optimization of the network. Uh, and finally, providing the data analytics that are required uh, to be able to determine in a short window uh, what to be forecasting moving forward. And then finally, we'll talk about here the, the tight labor markets. And it's interesting, as we all know, uh, as Kathy talked about, you know, unemployment at the end of 2019 was 3.7%. April, it climbs to 14 and then here in uh, September, we close around 8%. However, increased uh, unemployment benefits, we see the uncertainty when uh, the vaccine for COVID-19 uh, will be available, and expected higher peak season volumes has still created a challenge. However, at UPS, we understand this, but beyond these challenges, we're interested in attracting, investing, and training future supply chain experts during a tight labor market. Why? Because we do understand the importance of what type of individuals are required moving forward as to how to utilize the increasing the technology sophistications, um, the many customers that we have today recognize the importance of this and how important it is to be partnering with knowledgeable experts to meet their customer demands. So now is the time to engage a knowledgeable provider. We talk about intellectual capital. Let me ask you, uh, if, uh, do you have the experts to implement? We think of and maintaining the automation and, auto and autonomous types of equipment. In fact, the day of one supervisor ratio to 22 employees is really no longer a skill set required. Now again is the time to engage and and a knowledgeable partner. So as I close, the demand window is now shortened. We are all on the clock. Customers are shifting from B to B to B to C. This is probably the new norm. Reverse logistics is clearly blowing up. And just as the uh, points that were raised by Kathy, get ahead of it before it's too late. You know, renew our focus on digital visibility, data collection, and real-time information is now a must. Now is the time to ask a trusted, knowledgeable partner. These changes are occurring globally. So turn it back to you in the next slide. Oh, I tell you what, I mean, uh, so that's an interesting discussion on the back end. And thank you for raising that point. I think it's so, so incredibly important for our audience to understand the reverse logistics side. I think that, um, you know, a lot of, a lot of companies kind of jumped toward uh, the B2C because they had to, but then they got a little surprised with some of the surge maybe in the returns or the servicing of those goods, whereas they, they probably were serving the, the, servicing those, those types of things a little bit differently uh, in the past. And Kathy, I can tell you, it, it, uh, I know it's, it's still, uh, if we had a crystal ball, how much of this is going to be permanent versus what's going to ship, shift back and then how that's going to look. I'm sure is going to be very, very interesting as we move forward. So a lot there to unpack in terms of the front end, the back end, the dynamics in the, in the industry, and then how we can be more resilient, uh, as Philippe talked about, at the front end. But I think this next section, right, uh, is kind of the, the icing on the top. So let's talk about maybe this concept of how our audience and, and customers should be thinking about optimizing the overall, overall supply chain. Kathy, what, what are the trends that you're seeing in the space that are really bringing big impact to organizations as they think about this optimization of the overall supply chain? Sure, thanks, thanks, Jerome. Um, like Steve said, uh, there's a lot of automation, automation going on uh, and this technology investment is very important and I think a lot of companies, right as the pandemic was hitting or was occurring, a lot of uh, companies, it, it kind of hit home, particularly with um, a lot of folks not necessarily having the adequate enough visibility into their supply chains. When they're trying to source um, PPE goods, 
It was difficult because a lot of these uh, suppliers may have been closed uh, due to COVID. They could have been bankrupt. Who knows? Problem is, a lot of times uh, supply, uh, supply chains visibility only extends to maybe tier two suppliers. Not knowing what's beyond that second tier has always been a curious gray, fuzzy area for a well, lot of people. Or surprise. Yes, exactly. Uh, because they didn't have visibility down the chain. Exactly, exactly. And that took time to source that, uh, those items and such. So one of the key technology trends moving forward forward is that investment in visibility. Uh, Ernst & Young uh, survey, a recent survey, found that end-to-end -end visibility is a factor in creating a successful supply chain. Okay, duh. But um, only 6% of their s survey respondents indicated that they are very confident in their systems. And that's scary wow. because uh, this is so important. But not only is visibility important, but the adaptability to be able to adapt and um, be more proactive instead of reactive all the time is also very key moving forward because, you know, we, we're still th going through this pandemic, but we also have these other uh, occurrences going on that could disrupt any part of that supply chain. And overlying this adaptability is the cloud infrastructure. And the cloud is so important uh, for all businesses. Uh, you know, it, it levels the playing field also for small to medium-sized businesses, which is very important in today's world. And um, as you could tell on the, on the slide here, uh, IDC estimated that the spending on cloud infrastructure increased 2.2% during the first quarter of this year. Well, okay, 2.2%, big deal. No, it is a huge deal because it's, it's a year-over-year -year increase and, and it's a very large number. So we're going to see more of this. And finally, risk management. That's so important. You can't manage it, but you can mitigate it as best as possible. And Deloitte, in a Deloitte survey, uh, they found that those companies that have that proactively manage risk management, uh, they spend 50% less to, uh, their spend is 50% less to manage supplier uh, disrupt disruptions as compared to companies that don't. So I think all three of these are very broad, but very important uh, technology trends, especially as we move into the new year. Mm. So those are good, good trends. And you know we've all heard of uh, cloud technology but you know, it's important, I think, to go past the, the buzzword to the actual, how do we actually make this, this happen? So I'm gonna, I'm gonna kick it back over to you, Steve. I mean, you know, you've got real customers uh, with these challenges coming to you every day. Uh, how are we actually making this a reality and going beyond kind of the buzzword uh, and, and bringing a real impact to our customers? Well, it's, it is all about execution. And uh, when we talk about uh, how do we solve these challenges? Uh, certainly technology, automation do play a role. Uh, at UPS, we are investing in current and new facilities. Uh, we're entering new markets, uh, advancing automation, execution technology, which is extremely important to go along with the uh, physical uh, equipment to increase capacity and capability. You know, we are acting uh, so that our customers are prepared. When we talk about warehouse automation technologies, um, you know, we're partnering with the right people. Um, we understand the speed of which we must move. We cannot do this alone. So strategic alliances with the right uh, technology and um, automation, autonomous equipment vendors are critical to our success. Uh, warehouse technologies could help and most times do uh, reach the price points you as a customer need uh, to keep that buying relationship because as we move from a bulk to a trans uh, actional business, uh, the less expensive uh, uh, solutions are necessary uh, to meet the customers your customers demand. Um, when I think of an example, you know we continue uh, to expand the fleet of bots. 
uh, using fulfillment uh, for fulfillment orders. And depending on a number of factors, this automation uh, also can increase uh, the productivity by 25% and provides scalability volume fluctuations. You know, we talk about streamlining and we talk about the focus is maximizing that automation and technology tools to drive out waste and of course increase efficiencies and quality of service. So what does all of this mean? Well, beyond slotting and using labor management tools, we're capitalizing on the execution uh, technology that provides management uh, a physical flow product from receiving to shipping. Um, another point here is uh, our solutions engineers uh, understand the benefits of automation and technology. You know, saving in labor, talk about inventory flow and placement. We talk about reduction in energy costs as well. And that single flow process can be much faster. To share with you the feedback from our operations is that the logistics process that we're talking about in automation is carried out faster. We see more precisely reduce errors and improve our customer service. So let's talk about you can't manage what you can't see. You know, since COVID-19, uh, you know, digital capacity uh, has accelerated by years. I, I think we can definitely all agree with that. You know, the days of, you know, where a customer had to look in one place for their inbound air, then they would move on to another place for their inventory and their order fulfillment and for another place for the outpouring delivery is gone. At UPS, we now have UPS Supply Chain Symphony. Uh, we provide visibility to the inbound air freight, uh, clear customs through a free trade zone, order transport and delivery. This is critical. Why? Recently, we met with one of our customer CEOs and from the data and the information, we begin to imagine what are the next steps that will be required in our supply chain in the future with this customer. When we move down the line, we talk about artificial intelligence. You know, localizing inventory optimization is critical. Creating inventory for regions, countries, cities. We talk about building the characteristics that make the center of gravity unique. And then finally, those two lead to building out that optimized network. Predictability of analytics, using a combination of forecasting, optimization, simulation, exploring for future execution scenarios to ease the navigation of future uh, disruption. Connecting and digital, you know, here I think where we really begin to see on the freight side, the document intelligence, the bill of lighting extracts, it analyzes and moves the data to a transportation, <clears throat> excuse me, management system. And then Kathy talked about the cloud-based uh, technology allowing for a wider distribution of the network that includes collaboration with customers and additional logistics providers to meet their specific needs. So when we close this section, we talk about the importance of warehouse technologies, invest implementing technologies that deliver solutions where it matters the most to our customers. Feedback from our operators, user-friendly, providing precise and fast. You can't manage what you can't see. UPS Supply Chain Symphony provides overall visibility across multiple logistic services and can enable you to service your customer. Connect and, and digital in, uh, in, um, <laughs> cloud-based technology, let's just speak to the point. Collect technology allows for a wider distribution. It's obviously a very poor part. So we are committed to delivering the, the, the steps that differentiate UPS and makes it better for our customers to focus on their core business. So moving back to you, Jerome. Thank you for that. I can tell you, you know, jumped off the page early in your, in your comments, 25% efficiency gains. I'm sure that goes straight to the bottom line and clearly um, very interesting symphony allowing uh, that type of visibility to manage. As you say, you can't manage what you don't see. Um, I, and uh, I don't think we said it, but I mean, the customer service impact, right? Allowing us to understand further up the supply chain, what's going on so that we can inform our customers or even mitigate any sort of uh, missed opportunity that we have with customers. So this optimization 
uh, component involves not just one aspect um, of the supply chain, as we've talked about the front end and the back end, but it's really the synthesis of managing it overall. And I think to your uh, previous point, Philippe, you know, just taking an RFP type of uh, approach incrementally with different pieces, I think that given uh, COVID and everything that we're learning, we're actually uh, seeing that those customers and those companies that uh, prevail and that are stronger will actually take the optimization probably um, uh, more seriously moving forward. So given that, we asked at the beginning uh, of the uh, uh, discussion here, you know, what was on your mind? So maybe let's take a, a point in time before I kick it back uh, to you, Philippe, for some uh, for wrap and some comments. Let's see what's on our customers' minds. So at this point in time, uh, let's look at the poll results. Interesting. So we have we have uh, really our, it looks like our audience is is pretty well balanced, except almost fifty percent said, you know what, I'm worried about all of it. Um, at 49% for all of the above, but coming in a strong second, almost at 20%, 19.6, is the optimization discussion um, that we just talked about. So, Philippe, why don't you kind of wrap, what will be your, your comments uh, mm -hmm. to kind of wrap the all three of these sections based on our customers' concern? Let me answer one point where you said the optimization should go into a the bottom line, I would say no, potentially you should reinvest a portion of this into the digital play. But I'm going to, uh, to talk about it a little bit, I think. Uh, yes, so a conclusion and, uh, and maybe a resume of what we talked a little bit. The, uh, the focus on core business is a key driver and, and, and driving innovation, as we talked about. So March till July, I've been talking to uh, quite a lot of customers and I heard them telling me uh, that they want to focus on their core business. So that was at the heart of the pandemic. And of course, they were looking for uh, remediation on costs and making sure that they had cash flow. Uh, but today we see already the proof that the reality of outsourcing is coming. We are receiving our uh, RFQs uh, for contract logistics, but other things. So it's quite interesting to see that. And I would talk about the selection of trusted partner. It's a key element. Uh, you need to be able to think about matching on culture, value, purpose, to support the future strategy, and of course, to prepare for new changing environments. You need to be able to find a partner who is ready to transform on your behalf. That's an important one. Innovation, innovation to maximize change on emerging in good shape. So when we are looking at past information, 2008 financial crash, most innovative company dramatically outperform the pack the following years. So clearly innovation is an element that we, that's why back to your point on digital, let's, uh, on, uh, on uh, bottom line, let's put it back into innovation and digital. Then I will talk a little bit what was shared already, transparency and visibility. I think they will drive better decision making. So find ways to add predictive as uh, Steve was talking, predictive and prescriptive data analytics to avoid disruption. The end-to-end -end visibility is a key element build control towers to be able to make sure that you are working against the exceptions, against the issues that you have. Reprioritize capabilities, your forecasting, your lead time, your process to be able to uh, produce. Mitigate also the risk by reconfigurating the supply chain as we were talking with Cathy about shifting purchasing plans to near shore or control of the supplier's capabilities as we were talking tier one Go to tier two, go to tier three to be able to make sure that you are in control. Integrate more closely with your suppliers. That's key. But also your vendors, your customers. You need to be able to have a closed loop there. And I would place a strong emphasis on moving to digital, as I was mentioning earlier. Digital tools and lean processes enable organization to focus on maximizing cash flow. So you need to do it. And my final words of advice is, Take care of your people. It's very key during COVID-19 and the pandemic. We showed that transforming is possible when you have motivated people and, and colleagues. And of course, the last one, but very important to me, listen to your customers. They know what they want. 
and they know what they need. Back to you, Joe. Fantastic, Felipe. Yeah, I mean, double click on listen to your, your customers. Absolutely. It's all about the customer and focus on that. So at this point, pretty excited. We have, uh, we're going to open our Q&A uh, segment. We have lots of great uh, questions uh, coming in that we're, we're sorting through. Uh, so let me start um, with you, Philippe. Um, mm -hmm. Very interesting question here, and this kind of goes back to some of the impacts that we had with PPE early on this year and the disruption that we had. Uh, we've got a question around the vaccine shipments. Uh, and the question is, hey, w what are we hearing we're hearing more and more about the COVID-19 vaccine shipments. Is this the next wave of PPE that will impact uh, my supply chain? So clearly uh, uh, vaccines and uh, also all we, uh, what will goes with it, uh, syringe, uh, PCR tests, because you will have a series of, of these going on. And the vaccine, if I'm not mistaken, and we have got uh, health care, uh, SGI, which is tragic growth imperative inside UPS, where we are developing tight relationship with Nicole, with healthcare, with hospitals. So we have this uh, connection. And vaccines is certainly going to be two uh, vaccines that you will need. So you will have the lengths of the waves of, uh, I would say, what we have seen also with BP. Uh, so the vaccine shipments are going to be air freighted, no doubt. When I was in Europe uh, three weeks ago, we talked, I talked with a, a lot of uh, um, healthcare uh, companies, and I tried to suggest that we should anticipate a little bit. There is not going to be any anticipation. When they are uh, able to have the vaccine approval, then order, and then production, and then ship. It's going to be very, very fast. So uh, they, they are not going to be able to use other alternative mode. It's going to be air. And yes, to answer your question, I believe there is going to be a, a conjunction with a PPE. The difference is that I, I do think that we have learned, the, the market has learned the lessons on the PPE side, so we are a little bit more prepared. And when I was talking to these customers in, uh, in August, they were asking how UPS is preparing for capacity crunch. So back to a discussion about uh, uh, our air freight capabilities. Interesting. I think this is going to, to collide, I guess, with it. We talk about no peak season, but this is going to, looks like it may collide with uh, the normal peak season. So I, I think it's going to be well, very interesting. I do believe that when I was talking about waves, I do believe that uh, uh, production and distribution will be certainly uh, coming up very soon. The distribution will take a long lapse. Ah. So you are talking about 2021, 2021. Uh, 2022, when we are going to have the, uh, uh, the, the herd immunity uh, who is going to be touched, so uh, 5 billion versus the 7 billion that we are on this planet. That's the target that apparently the, uh, the pharmacy uh, companies are, are having or the healthcare company are having. Thank you. Thank you for that. I have a question for you. So is there going to be enough capacity, overall capacity, and will it be at the expense of other shipments. So that very valid question. I think that capacity is, is not going to be a constraint. We see two things, and I will answer to both. Uh, we see uh, first uh, the passenger aircraft who are being reconfigurating into charters, and, and even due to the fact that some of the airlines are having a big strain on cost, they are reselling some of the, the, these aircraft. These aircraft are then captured by companies who are going to do charters with them. So I don't think we will see a capacity issue. We will see a cost issue, and we will see certainly a drain because, uh, and, and I'm glad that uh, uh, there is multiple uh, fabrication of the vaccine, of the PCR tests and the syringe, because you need all that to be able to, uh, to uh, vaccinate everybody. Uh, that is going to be, depending on where it comes from, it can create local crunch. Uh, the second question that you were having was much more on the, uh, uh, the, the capacity for, for the, the productions to be able to be localized. I think that there is going to be a geographical play where we are going to see some uh, major players, China, India, who are going to uh, distribute locally their vaccines. We see also links. It's interesting to see also China 
supporting Brazil, Latin America into this. So it's going to create a, a crunch there because some of these, as you know well, there is no passenger aircrafts due to lockdowns. You must be have some sort of an ESP because we actually got a similar question. So we, we got lucky, <laughs> lucky that uh, you were able to ask uh, Philippe that question. But let me pivot over back to you, Steve. Uh, we got to keep you busy over there. So we got a question. Thank you. We got John. a question from the audience. And uh, uh, when you talk about uh, digitized supply chain uh, for a company, uh, what is the most important investment uh, that a company needs to make? And, and commit to first? Well, I think that where you get started, first of all, um, is it, it's important to, to plan, you know, the transition of change in your environment, because these tools can be extremely, extremely powerful. And it's important to recognize that this information is providing you important decision-making in the end. So where to invest first, it really has to start with how it's going to benefit our customers. At the end of the day, uh, customer service and customer first is absolutely most important. And to use the pillars of our own organization, uh, the people have to feel comfortable and empowered to utilize this information. And then finally, a continuation of innovation where digitalization tools, software, um, you know, warehouse execution systems have to be connected with the automation. And if it's not, um, then we're not really providing the full benefit. And so I think it's important, again, it benefits our customers. It uh, helps uh, execution and, and empowers our employees to make better decisions overall faster in a very dynamic environment. And that innovation has to be tied into the automation because at the end of the day, they must work together. You can become extremely productive, but you can be extremely inefficient at the same time. And I think that's where, if we think about where maybe the biggest pain point can be is obviously the dynamics of, of going from a efficient planned uh, model to this um, responsive, I think, is there. And then the reverse logistics, I think, is another area where uh, dealing with that and deposition and where we go with those products uh, is very critical. And I think digitalization will obviously is and will continue to play a major role. It's interesting that you mentioned that reverse logistics. We've got a question. We talked about the impact and, and I actually found that to be very interesting. Uh, you know, thinking about this aspect of uh, what's really gonna happen to reverse logistics and returns and et cetera with this surge, um, that kind of pivots to a question may maybe for you, Kathy, do, do you have any specific percentages or pers perspectives? How should our audience think about the impact on reverse logistics that's happening because of this surge? Mm, that's a really good question. And, you know, we've taught a lot of people tend to not even think about that side of the logistics. They tend, a lot of people seem to think uh, the whole logistics process is linear, but it is circular and with that reverse logistics. I personally haven't seen any numbers coming out, but with the rise, the, the, such the huge increases we're seeing in e-commerce, e it just screams, yeah. you know, yeah, more returns. It's blown I, up. I think it's blown up. Yeah, that, that, I, I think, in a short window. Steve, that is a, such a great, great description. And you've got to learn how to manage those. And I mean, not just now, but moving forward, um, it's so important because I've always heard that that number, 30 percent of all of e-commerce sales is returns. Well, I would venture to say it's even more than that now. Uh, and yeah, you've got to get a handle on that. There's a lot of good technology tools out there automating that process as much as you can. So, um, you know, that's about the best I can do with answering that question. I'm gonna throw it over to Steve. <laughs> well, let me add to that. I, I think like anything, right, we get back to avoidance yeah. of uh, quality issues or you know, what can we do more in the process itself? So we've got automation, we've got intelligent and, and committed people, but it's about that execution airproofing within the process. So I think as we are in a very dynamic, the quickest thing we're doing is because the demand is there, we got to get it out right now. We receive it and we reship it. 
but there still needs to be the disciplines in the process to validate, is it the right skew, is it the right color? And so this is where digitalization and continuous uh, improvements in process and, and, and quality to drive the air proofing or the, the number of errors down. Uh, if we can do that, that will help mitigate some of these costs. It costs money, obviously, to handle something twice. And uh, so we should all be working as partners, as uh, knowledgeable partners, to find ways to, to mitigate that. Because at the end of the day, uh, we're making good money on the front end, but maybe not so much after everything is netted out because of a surge and increase in peak and how we handle it. So I would challenge us uh, to continue to seek the solutions here on the front end versus trying to be better firefighters on the back end. Excellent. Excellent. I, I wish we had more time, but we don't. So I'm going to uh, kind of wrap up with this question, and, and I have the dubious task of, of uh, uh, f figuring out which ones we ask. But this one's this one's pretty time sensitive. We've got a couple of questions on whether there is time for a customer to actually engage with e fulfillment and get re uh, get engaged prior to peak season. So, Steve, I'll kick that one over to you. Yeah, it's uh, it's a great question, and we talked about it already today. Uh, E-fulfillment, UPSC fulfillment, uh, certainly live and well. And um, to answer your question specifically, the average is around 30 to 35 days it takes to actually, uh, from start to the process to the first ship. However, uh, this has been reduced in some cases to seven days. The first day really is the boarding process and utilizing the UPS website and going through the boarding process. Once that's complete, and then it's up to really the partnership to get the inventory shipped, received, uh, obviously put away, and then the order starting to fall. So the front end of, uh, of our program certainly allows for easy uh, to do business with to get you started. But I'll tell you, Jerome, the biggest challenge really is getting the inventory uh, to us so we can begin the, the e-fulfillment process. But again, that connects you with uh, Last Mile, uh, that provides uh, a lot of advantages. Now, the second part of that question is when can you, um, uh, when's the last date? Uh, well, you know, if we use 30 days, uh, there's only a few weeks left. Um, so the best answer I have for this one is inquire. We certainly want to solve your pain points. That's what we're here to do, to serve our customers. So uh, let's challenge each other and see what we can do to help one another uh, be successful in the peak. So and be successful partnership. So absolutely less engage, which actually takes us kind of to the wrap. And uh, on the next slide, if you want to get started with a, with a discussion with us, uh, you can see the information on the screen. You can obviously go to um, UPS SCS supply chain. Uh, and if you have uh, some additional uh, need for some more insights from Kathy, clearly uh, you, you have the information on the screen. But uh, to our panelists in the room, I absolutely want to thank everybody. Very engaging. Hopefully our audience got a lot uh, out of it, but it's not over. You can engage with us in many different ways so that we can help you. Um, but uh, we really want to thank you today. But uh, this, this is the type of information and guidance that makes our Be Unstoppable series so valuable. Uh, we're committed to partnering with you in your success by providing the right tools and solution to grow your business. And this webinar series is just one way we're making that happen. Another way you can partner with us is through our virtual consultation. So please take a moment to sign up. Just click on the virtual con con consultation icon at the bottom of your screen or go to ups.com forward slash consultation. It's a great opportunity to connect one-on-one -on -one with our team and learn about UPS solutions that can enable your business. As a reminder, this webinar and all UPS webinars are available at ups.com forward slash webinars. Stay tuned to our next Be Unstoppable webinar on October 22nd with very special guest, NBA All-Star and Hall of Famer and successful business person, Mr. Grant Hill. Nice. And if you missed it last month, be sure to check out the Be Unstoppable webinar with Magic Johnson. It was absolutely fantastic. Just go to ups.com forward slash webinars. Thanks for joining us today and be safe out there. Thank you, Joel. Thanks, Jerome. Thank you.